Um, I want to thank everyone for doing these um, quick uh, switchovers to our second session. So it's a um, famous line in writing and business uh, to always be selling, never stop selling, which in our case means to never stop presenting or pitching. We had a great session on Tuesday hearing about pitching from TechCrunch's experienced lead on running challenges. But today we're gonna to get down to the core of it, hearing from an actual investor who actually writes checks uh, to learn what it takes to motivate his pen. Uh, Shankar Chandran is a material scientist by training who has now spent uh, nearly 20 years making investments. Oh, who's on uh, mute and mute. There we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Shankar's a material scientist by training who spent has now been doing investments for 20 years, first at JP Morgan, then for eight years on the corporate side of investing uh, as managing director of the Catalyst Fund of Samsung Electronics and is now on the private side of venture investing as a partner in Walden Catalyst Ventures, which is a new fund, uh, just started focusing on hard tech, tough tech, deep tech, our space at XTC. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Shankar at Samsung and having several of my ideas turned down, which is, you know, that's part of the thing. Investors hear hundreds of good ideas every month and can only engage in so many. So it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, Shankar's talks have been appreciated at each of our previous two extreme tech challenges. So you have an audience here eager to hear what it takes for a deep tech idea to break through and grab your interest. So please go ahead. Sounds great. Uh, Victoria, how should I do this? Should I start with a few um, few words here and then perhaps uh, folks can jump in with questions? Would that work? Yes, we love it to be interactive. Super. And of course, uh, let me launch uh, right ahead. First, it's a privilege to be here uh, and talking to you all. Uh, it is, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's, this is really what gets me going, talking to founders and CEOs and, and executives of startups. Uh, this, this is why I do what I do for a living. Uh, just a quick introduction of the firm. Walden Catalyst Ventures, as it was mentioned, uh, is a, a relatively new firm. It's less than a year old. Uh, it's a roughly $600 million uh, fund. We focus on early stage investments in the US, Europe, uh, and in Israel, and we do deep tech. And for us, the definition of deep tech is really a breakthrough in science or technology that leads to a company. Uh, generally, uh, when you have a breakthrough, you tend to have some barriers to entry for your competitors to get in, and that allows for the company to really get to certain milestones that help the company then create a business model perhaps, or, uh, or other capabilities on top. And those are the kind of ideas that we generally gravitate towards. Um, so a few things I wanna say, uh, the elephant in the room is of course, the macro environment we find ourselves in today, uh, which is, I wanna say quite different from what it was perhaps even two or three months ago, or perhaps a year ago. Uh, what I mean by that is for a few years, uh, there was a situation where uh, raising money uh, for startups uh, got a little bit easier uh, than the norm. Uh, what I mean by that is there was a lot of capital that came into the industry from uh, alternate asset classes. Perhaps folks who used to invest in later stage investments or the public market, uh, they were all investing in the venture capital industry. And I think uh, several companies got lofty valuations, several companies got uh, overcapitalized, and it was relatively easier to do that in the last uh, few years. Uh, however, in the last few months, uh, for a combination of reasons, macroeconomic reasons, uh, perhaps uh, public markets having come down uh, substantially, particularly in the tech market, uh, you know, all the war in Ukraine, which is really sad, but the combination of many of these things have come together where uh, the market has changed quite substantially. So the point around uh, how you stand out and how you really pique the interest of a VC is all the more important today than perhaps it was a few months ago and 
so to have a really sharp uh, pitch and to have a really sharp message on who you are and why uh, you deserve to be taken seriously by the venture capital community becomes all the more important today uh, than it was perhaps a few months ago. Uh, one other point I will make, and then we'll open it up. I think uh, with the macro environment dramatically changing around us, uh, what is also important is the kind of things that you want to really emphasize upon uh, in your company uh, to really stand out. And I'll spend a minute on this. Uh, it turns out that uh, there is a technique that was created by the Stanford Research Institute several years ago. Uh, they call it the NABC technique. Uh, the letters are NABC. And if you want to Google Stanford Research Institute and the letters NABC, I'm sure you can find lots of public material on it. Uh, NABC is a, in essence, a scientific method uh, which at Stanford Research Institute asks researchers to articulate on what kind of ideas that that really should get funded internally, uh, you know, in their uh, in their institution. And NABC stands for N stands for the need uh, in the market that they are addressing. A stands for the approach. What is your unique approach to go address that need? Uh, B stands for the benefits, the benefits that, uh, that you are creating with your product or your service or your company. And C stands for competitors. And how do you really stand out against your competitors? Why is your approach different? Why is your uh, method fundamentally better and defensible? Uh, I find that uh, using a pitching technique that corresponds to the NABC technique is a really good approach that can get the interest of a deep tech VC because uh, the VCs typically don't just invest uh, in any company that just goes after a big idea, but they go after uh, companies that are addressing a real need in the market. And the nuance that I'll point out to you is today, particularly in this environment where arguably there's gonna be lesser budget uh, among, uh, among enterprises or your customers to be able to spend on your product or service uh, because of the macro environment, what is really important is to articulate not just the need in the market, but why it is urgent and why it is immediate. And I think starting with the market need uh, and articulating your company on why it addresses that need and why you as a team are really well positioned to go approach that opportunity is a really important way to think about how to pitch your company. So of course you should go back and read a little bit of the NABC technique and think about how you can articulate that in your pitch. but. I'll stop there for now and, and certainly open it up for questions. And I'm happy to talk about that more if needed. Okay, anybody, any, uh, any questions to start with? I, I have a question for Shankar. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the area that your firm invests in? Happy to. So, uh, the firm, as I mentioned, is a roughly $600 million firm. Uh, we have made 11 investments in the last uh, eight or nine months that we've been around. Uh, largely, we focus on the, on the intersection of data and AI. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, over the last several years, an enormous amount of data has been created across the board. Uh, whether it's inside of enterprises or by IoT, you know, devices uh, or consumers, uh, you know, so a lot of data has been created. We believe that multiple industries around us, whether it is the financial industry, the healthcare industry, or the manufacturing industry, all these multi-trillion-dollar industries are getting reinvented uh, because of data and because of analytics and, and ML that is being used on them. 
And as that transformation happens, it, it requires a completely new data stack. Uh, what I mean by a data stack is uh, all the way from the bottom of the data stack where how data is stored, how data is moved, how data is, uh, you know, data is, is analyzed. And then on top of that, how it is computed, how it is, uh, how it is really put together in a way that is presented uh, uh, in, a, in a nice way so that people can make business decisions. All of that needs to come together in, in a very interesting way. And we call that the full data stack. And we largely invest around that on multiple industries. We are an early stage investor. We typically do seed stage investments or series A investments. And our check sizes tend to be as little as maybe $2 million, perhaps all the way up to 20. Is that helpful? Yes, I, I see uh, Anastasia, you have your uh, hand raise icon up. What was your question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Anastasia Jackson. Uh, I am currently creating an app that is going to be collecting a lot of data from HBCUs. I plan to um, put all the students, staff, faculty, alumni on one network and um, just to boost the efficiency of HBCUs around the US. Um, I was looking into how the AI is very useful on social, like social networking apps like that as they target that data. But I want to know if you pick your brain a little bit about the humane part of it, um, because I do notice with the different apps nowadays, uh, there's been a, that AI is getting so good that it really has people addicted to their programs. And I want to kind of keep that in mind as I'm building mine. Do you have any insight or knowledge? Sure. It's a little bit uh, off topic, but I'm happy to kind of give you a high level sense, Anastasia, if that's okay, right? Because we're, we're going to talk primarily about pitching, but you bring up a really important uh, point. Um, you know, how data is used and what kind of data is used for training and what kind of data is really used for uh, bringing out the right kind of inferences and predictions is super uh, important. Uh, data might inherently have certain biases. Data might have uh, certain uh, inputs because at the end of the day, there's people creating the data and annotating the data and that might lead to certain conclusions that might either uh, be accurate or completely be off, right? And so fundamentally, I think as you're building uh, uh, an app focused on, uh, on data, you want to be really conscious about what kind of data uh, is really being used. And this is an important point where if you go back to the NABC approach, I talked about the A part of the NABC technique, which is your approach. How is it that you know, your approach to handling data and creating your uh, product or service is fundamentally a very, very, uh, uh, very sensitive to the, the way the data is handled and therefore you have a better product or a better service uh, would be a very important point to articulate because at the end of the day, that's the way you're gonna get confidence, uh, uh, better confidence in your product or your service uh, being efficacious. Is that helpful? Okay, since we have time, I'm going to do these each um, one at a time. Um, Krazy, you had a question about uh, not having the full product yet. Do you want to unmute and uh, ask about that? And then, then Ravi will get to you similarly. Yeah, sorry, hello. Uh, so we are in a very early stage startup and we're developing a technology, but it can affect multiple markets. And we're not sure if we need to focus on a product wrapping right now, or we should continue developing our technology as it is. So on a, such an early stage pitch, what should we focus on? The potential of this technology hitting and disrupting multiple markets, or we should focus on actual market product fit? I think that's a fantastic question, Krasimir. Let me kind of uh, give you my thoughts on how to do this. Uh, so 
the first thing you really want to think about, particularly in an early stage company, uh, is to talk about your team. Okay, that is 90% of the puzzle. Okay, now, when I say talk about your team, it does not mean, uh, you know, pull up your LinkedIn profile or uh, talk about which schools you've been to, uh, which a lot of people do. I'm talking about something more nuanced. Why is it that your team that you've put together have a cumulative of lifetime experiences in the space that you are in that makes you an extraordinary team, right? Fundamentally, for early stage investments, that is one fundamental belief among VCs, which is extraordinary people do extraordinary things. And building a startup is super hard, right? You want to be able to do something truly extraordinary for you to stand out, not just stand out among VCs, but eventually build a great company, right? That's why we're all here. So talking about the team, what is it that you've experienced in your team? What is it that you have done? What is it? What are the great things that you have done that enables you to be the dream team for that particular problem? And, and that is super important. So you start with that. Uh, after that, what you really want to talk about is going back to the NABC technique, right? Which is before you talk about your approach to doing your particular problem, what is the problem? Why is it a big problem? Now you've talked about, you, you can really go after multiple things, right? Which is totally fine, but you want to be able to start with a problem among those multiple targets that is big enough, that is urgent enough, and that is immediate enough that you can address first and why you have a vision for addressing that problem today using that early stage approach. Now, notice uh, I'm not saying product market fit, right? Product market fit generally involves building something or uh, having a prototype that you've actually tested with the market and, and the market is giving you feedback that there is a really strong fit. And typically that feedback means they're paying you for it, right? That lies pretty far down the road and there's a chicken and egg problem. You need to be able to get there, right? So given you need money to be able to get there, what you have to rest back upon is really back to the team, your vision and your approach and your approach being very unique and different from the way it has been addressed by everybody else and why your approach is defensible even though you haven't built it yet. And that kind of a uh, articulation of, of what you're doing is likely to get you much more attention among VCs uh, today versus, you know, really trying to, you know, talk about, you know, your five-year financials or your, you know, or what, how much revenue you might make three years from now, because there's very little confidence in that, but there's a lot more confidence around, you know, your team and, and, you know, what, and why is it that you are most equipped to go after the problem? Does that make sense, Krasimir? Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks a lot. So the strong points of a good pitch without product wrap is actually the team, the potential of building the technology, and, and that's pretty much the most important thing. Yes, more. And more importantly, not just the potential, but your approach. Why is your approach yeah. fundamentally unique, different, and defensible? Right? Yeah. And I would underline one other thing which is uh, you have to articulate why what you're going after is not only a big opportunity, but it is right now, right? It is a, it's an urgency. It's a, uh, you know, uh, I'll use a, you know, somewhat of an analogy, right? Because we, we're all in the middle of the pandemic, if not towards the tail end of it. Why is it that what you're building is a vaccine, not a vitamin? That gives you the urgency, right? That if you build that, you know, people are going to be safer or people, are, their lives are going to be safe. There is an urgency about it that is a, there is a way to talk about what you're building as being really important to that market, not just a nice to have. I think you go back on those fundamentals before your product is ready. Sure. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. 
Okay, Ravi, you had a question in a similar vein, but a little different about uh, telling the story of, of iterations and pivots. Do you want to uh, go direct and talk? Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, Shankar, thank you so much for this discussion. It's been wonderful. Uh, so I, I run a company called Udify. It's a mental health care platform, a hub. And our thesis has changed over time. Uh, so we first thought it was cost stigma and access that we need to solve for. So we built a direct to consumer platform to connect you with therapists and other providers. Uh, we learned that the unit economics for an early stage startup to do that, uh, like many other startups, is very difficult to manage those unit economics. Uh, so we pivoted to enterprises and what enterprises wanted to see was clinical data to show the efficacy of what we're building. So we did the clinical trial, that took some time, uh, but we got a lot of data and we learned a lot from quantitative and qualitative interviews. So we took that data, uh, presented that to enterprises and, you know, Long, longer sales cycle with enterprises, but they're, they're getting excited about it. However, as we're kind of telling the story to VCs of how much time it's taking, it's, you know, how do you kind of tell the story of like, hey, we are, we're not one of those startups that, you know, got to 4.2 billion in three years. Like that, that's just not, you know, the, the growth trajectory that we're on. We're trying to be thoughtful about our thesis that, that is sustainable and that works. Um, and it's not like a kind of churn and burn uh, kind of model and just throwing money at, at the problem. So we've tried to be as thoughtful about it, but I feel like sometimes that doesn't land as well with VCs that want that, you know, month over month, you know, non-patient capital kind of approach. So I'd love to just get your thoughts on how to story tell that. No, happy to, it's a great question, Ravi. So let me kind of uh, make sure I, I got, got most of what you said, but, but echo back in terms of how you might think about it, right? So I think building a company, you know, uh, is a journey, right? Sometimes it's two steps forwards, you know, two steps backwards, you know, you go sideways before you really get to, uh, you know, a clear signal that you can focus on and you can really invest behind. So the fact that uh, you've taken a journey before getting to where you are today is generally, okay with most VCs, but it's really important to articulate a few things that's happened along the journey that's helped you to get to where you are today. Uh, for example, uh, you talked about the learning cycles. You talked about how earlier on you had a hypothesis and the hypothesis proved to be wrong, uh, after which you moved towards a different hypothesis uh, with enterprises. And with enterprises, you were able to get a really strong signal of a better product market fit. And then eventually, now you're, you're saying that that signal is strong enough that it's investable to really build a much larger enterprise. But how do you really walk through the story to, uh, to be able to articulate this? So a few things, Ravi, you may want to think about is why the learnings that you've done over time, the iterative learnings that you've done over time has really helped to make your current approach and your current product or service world-class. Also, uh, the notion of others going after this problem will also have to really go through the same kind of learning curves to get to where you are today. And those gives you barriers to entry. That, those gives you competitive advantage that you will have against others going after the same opportunity, right? The third thing you may also want to talk about is particularly at the very uh, the last learning cycle with enterprises uh, what you've learned that is really going to help you scale the business. Uh, you're making the point that, gosh, it's taken me X number of years to get to this point. However, where I am today is an extremely strong signal that helps me really ramp up from this point onwards. And here is what I'm really hearing from my customers. These are the referenceable customers that you can talk to, you know, VC. Uh, and this is going to help you get comfortable that from this point onwards, we're hitting an inflection point, right? So I think you want to be able to walk through all that logic, uh, you know, in a very crisp way based on data. And rather than being defensive about how long it's taken you to get here, if you really turn it towards the learning cycles and really turn it towards why that learning has helped you be a better company today, that might have a better uh, better resonance with some of the investors. Does that make sense, Ravi? Totally, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And sorry I couldn't be on camera. My nanny shows up at nine, so I'm just uh, playing double duty here. But I, that was really helpful. Thank you. All good. 
Okay, Brandon, uh, you can unmute. Uh, next, we have a different uh, space of financial technology. Yeah, correct. Hi, um, I'm uh, CEO of Stone Step. We make insurance work for vulnerable households by providing uh, the mass distributors and mass market channels which reach them, give them a better answer to what is this worth to me. Uh, last year, we our platform handled about two and a half million policies. We exceeded that already uh, by April of this year. Um, my question is really about what deep tech VCs do, because I've somehow always thought of them as being 90% about the tech and 10% about the data, whereas in insurance, I for sure see the opportunity as we need to own data and lots of it, and then keep running fast on improving our AI and analytics and all the rest, but that it's, it's data first. Am I misunderstanding what deep tech VCs are interested in? No, I'm happy to articulate uh, what that means because that may just be helpful for you guys to think about. Okay, so let's say you have an insure tech company like yourself. Uh, if you're building, if you're starting today and building your insure tech company, you're more likely to be sitting on top of the modern data stack. Okay, if you had started five years ago, you were probably sitting on, on some cloud somewhere, but not the modern data stack. And if you were doing this 10 years ago, you were probably on-prem, uh, you know, uh, inside of enterprises, building bespoke uh, financial models for them to make things work. Now, deep tech VCs, as I mentioned, really we think about the underlying infrastructure. So we focus on data infrastructure. So a big chunk of our investments have really been around the emerging data infrastructure. So think insure tech, for example, there is a massive explosion in data, right? Uh, in terms of data, not only data, consumer data or enterprise data that may be helpful for you to make an assessment of what the risk is and perhaps you know, think about what kind of premiums uh, one might want to think about for that particular uh, situation. You might also think about all the data that's created by claims, right? A huge amount of unstructured data. You know, perhaps it is you know uh, homes getting you know uh, hit by 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 a hurricane and pictures and huge amount of data over there, right? And how do you really make a assessment looking at the data on what what the claim should be, right? So you're talking about a massive set of data. But you're also thinking about this massive set of data that probably sits in a lot of different silos, right? They're not, they don't all come together and you can't just look at all of them together. And oh, by the way, the data might be very much, um, you know, a poorly annotated. So you can't really learn, uh, you know, deep insights from it, right? Uh, so, so there's a lot of these fundamental plumbing issues related to data, as well as fundamental compute issues related to how this data can be looked at and therefore uh, can be, you can actually get real time answers rather than starting a five month project before you can really understand uh, what the data is telling you. So that's what we call the modern data stack, which is fundamentally different from the old data stacks. And so making the data stack fundamentally more efficient and enabling industries like FinTech, like healthcare, you know, like manufacturing. And so we really below the application level, looking at all the breakthroughs that need to happen to make this process fundamentally more efficient. Hopefully that makes sense to you because uh, what that means is, uh, you know, uh, if you look out there today, uh, you know, you have data lakes and data reservoirs being created, right? And these have a different, uh, uh, you know, data structure compared to say perhaps the cloud, the native cloud infrastructure that existed before them. Uh, what we believe is there is even a next paradigm shift because today it involves moving tons of data onto uh, uh, onto the cloud or onto the data warehouses for any of the any of the work to be done. We think the future is about distributed data infrastructure. You should be able to be able to do the compute and the uh, and the analytics 
uh, you know, completely in a distributed way and yet in a very efficient, a cost efficient and in a, in a timely way. That's where we see the data infrastructure going and that's where we are really investing. Hopefully that's helpful for you, Bren. Uh, could, could I just follow up on that? Because I, I thought it was interesting you said if, if, if we had built it 10 years ago, it would be more or less obsolete and five years ago it would be quasi obsolete and building it right now, it would probably be modern. That would say to me that in five years, it'll whatever we're building today will be obsolete and in 10 years, it'll be obsolete again. So um, um, why is it not starting from the data? If I walked in with all of the insurance data for the entire world of everything that, that exists and let's assume that it's somewhat clean, um, would that not be an investable asset to then say, well, let's let's upgrade the tech on this, let's change how, how the tech is working to do it? It is, but, but uh, I'm saying something slightly orthogonal, Brian, and I agree with what you said. Uh, what I'm saying is innovation uh, happens in waves, right? Uh, the fundamental plumbing to how you handle data transforms every few years. Typically, it's five or six years. Yeah. And it's typically because of breakthroughs in semiconductor technology, which can do much faster uh, you know, compute. Uh, it could be related to the better networking technology and how you bring together data. It could be better database technologies and how you actually look at large amounts of data and yet can do uh, very quick analytics. It could be new ways by which you can query the data, right? Not just using SQL, but perhaps using natural language processing, right? Each of these actually adds up. And sometimes you have a confluence of these technology breakthroughs that come together that completely enables a new architecture. So these don't, so it's not about a quest to go after a new technology. It's about the belief that fundamentally when you have great engineers focused on big problems, breakthroughs happen every few years and you wanna to try to capitalize on what those breakthroughs are, right? And that is what creates these, these disruptions in the market. This is why, Folks who have built a great business today may get, you know, may get taken out in a few years. And that creates this creative destruction in the industry that, that creates great opportunities for entrepreneurs, right? So as a, as a startup, you're David versus Goliath, right? So how do you how do you fight Goliath? You know, you need to have some secret, you need to have some superpowers, right? You know, you need to have that sling that you can, you know, you can hit hit against Goliath. You need to be agile you need to have uh, you need to be you need to be up to date in what you're standing on so you have a competitive advantage against an incumbent who's been there for a long period of time and so i think capitalizing on the latest greatest technology when you're building your fintech company gives you that advantage because arguably your competitors sitting are sitting on the older data stack which means they can't process as fast they can't do things as fast and, and you have to be faster. You have to be better. That's your uh, ability to go take them out, right? So that's why it's about thinking about what you're doing and putting it in the context of the latest, greatest framework that is available today and taking advantage of that because the incumbents, uh, they made their bets and they're stuck there. And transforming from there is a huge project. It's going to cost them a lot of money. And that's an attack vector for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bill from New Frontier, uh, let's bring you up. He had a question about um, team credibility and selling that. Right, thanks, John. Hi, Shankar, thanks for the great presentation and the great insights. Um, so we're uh, Bill, I'm Bill Brunner, CEO of New Frontier Aerospace. We're building a solution to the problem of long and miserable intercontinental flights and the billions of tons of carbon that the airlines put in the atmosphere by building a hypersonic vertical takeoff and landing, renewably fueled uh, hypersonic aircraft uh, to deliver people in cargo anywhere on earth in two hours or less. So our, our challenge is that I've assembled a team of the person who invented the 3D printed rocket engine, who, who um, flew the first vertical takeoff and landing rocket 25, 30 years ago, 
But because what we're doing is such a big challenge, regulatory, technical, and all the rest of that stuff, people are getting having a hard time wrapping their heads around um, us being able to do this, right? I was a senior executive at NASA. I used to fly supersonic airplanes. I, I can't imagine. But literally 25-year-olds who used to work at SpaceX are raising money and we're not. So I don't, maybe is it that we're too old or maybe it's too scary what we're trying to do. I'm just, and the benefit is huge. Clearly this market is a trillion dollar market in the out years. So I'm, I'm asking, is it a storytelling thing or what is it? Or just do we need to pitch more? We've pitched maybe a hundred DCs. Maybe we need to pitch a thousand. I think that's a fantastic question, Bill. Uh, I'll try to answer the best I can without having seen your pitch or without, you know, having gone deep to, you know, to think about, you know, how do you really pitch your business, but I'll make some generalizations and hopefully that's helpful for you. So a few things I would say, uh, you said a few things here about your team, uh, which is really interesting, right? You talked about uh, one of your, you know, of co-founders perhaps, you know, who has done a 3D printing of the engine. You talked about yourself, from NASA and having flown air, uh, airplanes, et cetera, uh, which, is, which is all fantastic in terms of just articulating your team and, and what you're going after. But I do think there's a handful of other things that you want to think about, which is uh, as you go out to, to, to do a startup, uh, having people in your team, particularly senior team members, who've had that experience in raising capital in, in pitching to VCs and having going from zero to one, right? So if you think the startup journey is say zero to 10, 10 being you're like SpaceX, right? I noticed SpaceX just raised some money at 125 billion that they announced this morning. So if you think SpaceX is kind of the goal of a startup in your space, that's kind of where you want to go, uh, you know, and you'll want to go from zero to one uh, you want to think about what are the team members you have around you, you know, who've had that experience of going from zero to one. Now you have to define one, that one might be that you build a prototype, but that to build that prototype, you need to have uh, uh, the experience of people, you know, who've actually taken the company through that, which is the engineering talent, uh, the, uh, you know, not just the technology, but how do you actually problem solve and iterate and build something in a in a in a in a cash starved environment, which is generally what startups are, right? And and how perhaps you know some of the team members have that experience in having raised money before, having built those team members, uh, you know, in the early days. And so I think if you really pull together, this is a combination of not just the technologists who's done. Uh, 3D printing of engines, not just the NASA supersonic flight pilot, but we have, you know, uh, C, right, which is the person who's done this before in terms of, uh, you know, having put together engineering teams in the early stage, uh, you know, which can scale and solve some, you know, and not just, you know, not just, uh, uh, you know, show that they can solve problems, but actually build something and prove that it works, right, as well as, you know, perhaps someone who could who could who could you know basically help you go articulate this story in a very clear way and the combination kind of gives you the sense that okay this is a team that together can go deliver that right as yeah. as frustrating that it might be that a young young team or a spacex might have done that the proxy there is spacex went through a revolutionary uh, inflection point at a certain period of time. It is this belief that people who've kind of experienced that in that space have seen things and done things in a new way, right? Like using maybe automobile grade products to build space grade technology, right? I'm just making that up, uh, you know, because NASA is used to having these high precision components that are bespoke and specifically made, you know, and tested in, in, in so many different ways before they go on stuff, right? Versus, you know, how SpaceX has kind of revolutionized the model. And that experience may actually be something 
that VCs might look for. I'm not a space investor, but I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, intuiting from what you said. So perhaps that kind of experience may also be very interesting for you. Perhaps your approach is about the new way of building uh, the supersonic uh, aircraft. You may want to think about, you know, the DNA in your team that actually has that experience to augment what you already have. And that combination may actually be extremely, uh, you know, strong for a, for a VC. Does that, does that help, Bill? Well, I guess I wasn't clear enough because my guys have actually built and flown things before these kids were born. That's my challenge. And I know, you know, I, know. Have a, you know I know, but actually, my point, so, if I can... so, and, and hold on just a second. I, we, we uh, have a, you know, we're building and testing stuff now on DOD contracts using sort of faster techniques. And this was sort of fabricated and 3D printed in three months. And we're going to hot fire it here in a few weeks. So we're not just theoreticians or people who did things 30 years ago. We're, you know, on the leading edge, building things now that work. And so I think what I did hear from you, though, that is useful is we don't have anybody who has successfully um, done the, the sort of storytelling, the zero to one storytelling that our competitors seem to be more successful at. And so I, I, I did learn a lot from what you had to say. So I, I appreciate it. Sure, and I would add one more thing to what you uh, what you just uh, uh, paraphrased there, Bill, which is uh, not just the storytelling from zero to one, but the experience yeah. of zero to one. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so my again, you know, we just came. One of my co-founders just came from a zero to one startup that is very successful in this space. So we we've got the technical zero to one, but we don't have the fundraising zero to one. That's what we don't have because he was a CTO at that company and he went through all of that. He invented a rocket engine that works and is being sold now. And based on that is where that pump I just showed you came from. So we've got the technical piece and we've got the deep experience base, but we don't have that zero to one CEO because that's not me. I'm sort of like uh, Mr. 40 years in the industry, right? So I, I think it's a it's a skill set that I don't have that we need to recruit. I I would strongly encourage you to constantly iterate the story, yeah. right? And also the other thing I would say, Bill, is think about the investors that you want to go pitch, right? So not all VCs are the same. Uh, there are certain types of VCs who have uh, done their base work on your space. They have. Right. They, they might also have tribal knowledge. What I mean by tribal knowledge is this is not technical knowledge, but it's pattern recognition. They've done yeah. a bunch of investments. Right. They have battle scars on their back. You know, they, they know what to do, what not right. to do, perhaps. Right. So you want to be targeting your investors on, uh, you know, the ones who actually have this uh, experience in your space. And, yeah. and as you have that conversation, you learn from every one of those pitches. And you right. want to come back and iterate and you want to you know, get better the next time you go. And so doing more pitches with the right people will absolutely help. Right. Thank so you. It's not Thank a thousand you. pitches, but the this right is ones. A, this has been very valuable. I would have paid you for this consultation. So thanks for giving it to me for free. Of course. It's my thanks. pleasure. Okay. Next up, uh, Manu, if that's you from Cogniable, uh, you had your hand uh, raised. Uh, yeah, hi. This, this is now in a, a different space of uh, digital health. Uh, which I know you like, and it's about uh, childhood education uh, for autistic children. Uh, so Manu, please go ahead with your question. Yeah. Hello, Shankar. Hi. Uh, thanks for your valuable insight. See, I'm from India, and uh, you know we, we did a very large clinical trials uh, to detect children on neurodevelopmental delay uh, using their video, uh, audio data, and you know develop some deep learning models on which we really got two patients as well in India. Uh, and then we developed the treatment platforms uh, digitally, which could personalize and could do the tailor-made stuff. Uh, and we managed these two, three years on grants and did the complete development and validation through clinical trials with large hospitals in India in almost $250,000, right? And we have been struggling on raising funds, uh, but we really realized it later on that the, the market in which we developed this probably doesn't feel, uh, I mean, like India would never value. I mean, it is it is good, but, you know, the commercialization of the technology is not there because the insurance or the payers are not there, right? 
And in the US, we couldn't find uh, because we were all guys who know how to do it with PhDs and all. We could never reach out to the right investors on the state side. Uh, you know, so I mean, how do you solve this dilemma where uh, and and anyone if you want to enter into the US geography, there are multiple barriers about the validation and cross bridge trials that you need to do. And how do you make an in investor interested in you when you have a technology proven at least on the development side in one geography, but on the commercialization and the returns on it in the other geography needs some definitely some add up and patches. I think it's a great question. So let me kind of thread the needle through it and hopefully this is helpful for you. So a few macro points, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's a it's it's a somewhat frustrating uh, healthcare ecosystem because, as you know, there's about seven or eight trillion dollars of healthcare spend all over the world, and roughly about four to five trillion of that is the U.S. Right. So this is yes. this is this is the largest uh, ecosystem, if you would. Uh, that's combination of everything, combination of drugs and services and all that put together, right? So the question is, how do you really go after the U.S. market? And how do you articulate that though you are in a different place, uh, you have uh, an understanding of how to approach that market so that you can really show the VCs you're not just a technical oriented company that has built a data platform and, and the ability to do uh, what you're doing, but to really navigate the FDA or the uh, regulatory framework that exists in the US, as well as being able to you know, bring what you have created onto the right, uh, right customers, the right hospitals, the right service providers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it comes really back to a few things uh, uh, I can draw upon that you might, might be helpful for you. Number one uh, goes back to the team, right? So in your team, uh, you want to be able to talk about why in addition to the technical talent and the PhDs that you have put together, you have that knowledge of the U.S. market, you have that, uh, you know, the DNA of the team, that really understands the regulatory framework or how to partner and how to bring something like this out, uh, you know, uh, uh, out into the market that really matters in your space, right? To build a large company. Number two, uh, you also wanna uh, think about partnerships with leading hospitals in the US. Uh, for example, if you had a relationship with UCSF, right? Or, or Johns Hopkins or, or Cedar sinai one of these really large, hospital chains where, uh, you know, not only have you done the base level of data analysis using the data that you created in India, but you've been able to incorporate some of that data. You've been able to show that your models or your applications works on some of that data. And you've been able to build that partnership. In other words, you made some baby steps towards approaching the US market. That might be able to help uh, with some of your uh, some of your uh, capability here as well, right? The third thing I would say is you can take a page off the book from the IT industry in India, right? The IT industry in India has been super successful in creating cross-border companies, uh, right? Which is a lot of the technical talent uh, will still be in India, but you basically have key executives, you know, who are based in the U.S who are really customer facing and who are much more oriented towards building the business development and, and things like that, which is having a presence here with that type of capability in the US to augment what you have in India would be viewed as a one plus one equals three, right? So you can think about how uh, that can come together as well, even though you're not directly a traditional IT company, but focused on the healthcare space, right? So I think to leverage those capabilities might give you a much stronger pitch in my view. Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a, I agree what you are saying, but the whole thing is when you are, when you probably build a product in, you know, in $300,000, what would have actually been done in four, $5 million, right? That's what we, I think, I, I really expected that, you know, uh, someone i think the whole ecosystem would support uh, on at least the product outcome and probably help us on the commercialization but 
I think the whole, uh, you know, missing point is that to to have someone in the team that knows that geography, where the commercialization happens best. I think that was something that we are still lacking on. I I think so, and I wouldn't, you know, I think articulating that you've spent three hundred thousand dollars honestly doesn't bring you much because it's sunk cost, right? It's you want to yeah. you want to look at the road ahead. Uh, it's about uh, you can't drive looking at the rearview mirror, right? You want to you want to show. This is where you're headed, right? And and if if the U.S. market is where you're headed, that's your story. Then to make that story resonate, you want to have certain foundation stones laid, and the foundation yeah. stones would involve, you know, a cross-border team and some relationships uh, that matter in in this market, right? I think the combination of that is important, and it's less about you know, what you've already spent in the last uh, several years, even though that matters a little bit, but that's not the main story. It's the road ahead. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. I think that's a very valuable input. We'll work on that. Okay. We're, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but we have time for a couple more. And I will mention uh, the Victoria put Shanker's LinkedIn uh, in the chat. If you want to uh, read up or connect with him, uh, that is in the uh, chat box now. Uh, Pal, you have your hand up. Yes, hi, everybody. Shankar, excellent presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, so um, I never heard this before, actually. I, I let, let me call it your concept of deep tech. Um, this emphasis on, on team is, is very, very interesting because uh, <clears throat> um, I understand that deep tech is very difficult to, to validate, evaluate, because the technology is not ready yet, requires a lot of money, a lot of risk, and, uh, and therefore you go... Um, and solve this problem of, of concentrating, concentrating on the team. So who are those people? Are they credible enough? They have the experience from zero to one. I just want to ask you to, to apply this concept of yours uh, um, uh, to, on hardware, because in hardware, I am a hardware um, startup. We are in machinery. We are developing a new kind of gearbox. Uh, similar to Casimir's project, we, we um, have a technology which is applicable in the entire machinery industry, all segments, everything that moves. Uh, so on one hand, we have a hard time to, uh, to concentrate on markets because we would need to the feedback um, um, from various, various market segments to know which one we should be focusing on, uh, on, but that requires a lot of money. On the other hand, what you are saying that, okay, um, just do your technology, but concentrate, concentrate on the team and credibility and experience, that's very, very interesting. So I learned a lot from you to this time, but that's also uh, difficult because just like in the case of uh, uh, going for the market, the product and the technology requiring a lot of money, difficult to get for early stage deep tech. It's also difficult to get the experience, uh, those people who actually would be in the team, especially for the same reason that, that, that the technology is very early stage, uh, very deep and uh, who knows what, where it will go and difficult to get that kind of high, high tech experience and, and the team together. So I'm asking, could you kind of this excellent concept of yours with focusing on a team, can you kind of apply this concept on hardware startups? How, how we would actually do this approach? What would you like to see if you see a hardware startup coming to you? Yeah, no, happy to help. Uh, and I'll talk about hardware startups in generality versus, again, specifically your type of hardware, which I know very little about. Uh, because I just don't know, uh, you know, your company. But I'll, you know, overall, let me. A, a semiconductor company is a is a hardware startup, right? For me, because you're actually building a chip uh, that can potentially do something thousands of times faster, right? So, um, so overall, here is the right way to think about it: uh, venture capital as an asset class used for building startups does, is not the most efficient way to do things. Uh, across the board. It so happens that venture capital industry depends on one thing, and you know, I refer to this tribal knowledge, right? It's, it's really pattern recognition. A lot of times venture capital has been successful in certain types of innovation. And those are the areas where you tend to have more and more and more learning cycles. Semiconductor industry is a perfect example of that. For the, you know, one of the first semiconductor industry companies that was funded by venture capital was Fairchild Semiconductor about 40 years ago, right? And out of that came, I want to say, hundreds of semiconductor companies uh, in Silicon Valley and all over the world that's been wildly successful, right? But one of the key elements, and they're all hardware companies, why is it that those companies got funded 
and how did those teams come together? There's a few common threads for them. Number one, semiconductors actually involves this core concept of design using software and testing the design in an extremely strong, robust way and iterating and simulating it before you actually build any hardware. So building a semiconductor does not involve hundreds of iterations of semiconductors before you get to the right one. It actually involves hundreds of design iterations before you actually build the first semiconductor. Okay, so all of a sudden you're 90% software and 10% hardware, right? So now go back to the fundamentals of thinking about how you wanna show that what you're building is fundamentally unique and why what you're building is super valuable. So it's about attracting the right talent and doing it in a super efficient way. And the learning cycles and software design is a lot faster compared to actually building something and testing it in the market. And so you want to be re-architecting your approach to make it work. How do you make, uh, you know, how, how do you increase the learning cycles and how do you articulate that? That's one thing you may want to think about, right? The second thing you want to think about is really comes down to the team and the founders, right? So you talked about how it's hard to attract, uh, you know, talent when you still haven't proven stuff. So one of the key jobs, so the founder of a company, absolutely your core job, is to evangelize and bring on the greatest talent you can bring on, right? Which means sometimes you have to sell ice cubes to Eskimos. You're convincing somebody in a big company who might take a pay cut to join your company, right? And work really hard to do something and take a huge amount of risk because there's gonna be glory at the end of the day. You're gonna do something amazing, right? You're gonna evangelize these great people to come and join you because you're doing something really awesome and exciting, right? So that is really the core, you know, uh, founder capability, which is to be able to convince people to come and join you so that you can go on this journey together. I think it's that combination of approach and having that team put together, even though you haven't proven anything, right? If they still, if the, uh, if you can't convince great talent to come on board, they're probably not the right people to take a startup risk, right? So you want to think about those combinations as you go, uh, you know, iterate on your on your pitch. Yeah, I understand all this, but hardware is especially difficult from both point of view. As you said, go for the software, Don't try to emphasize the software part of your hardware that will make it easier and go for the, the team, as, as you said. Hardware is, is uh, kind of in a disadvantage of, of all the others because it's much more difficult for hardware companies. It's, it's difficult because of the long learning cycles. The yeah. question then becomes how do you shorten learning cycles because it's all about iterations, right? And that could be done in software versus building. So if you delay the manufacturing of, or the prototyping and do the iterations in software, you'll have much stronger advantage because you know, take, the, take the example, a semiconductor company today is 90% software and 10% hardware. And, and I'll just quickly mention, uh, that this may be related to that. We had uh, a speaker from Cadence Design Systems on yesterday and they just did this deal with McLaren Formula One. And so you have something that's extremely mechanical in the race car uh, that's now saying we're made better because we use Cadence modeling to, uh, to iterate our designs continually. So, uh, that's very interesting. We're at the top of the hour, uh, so we should uh, let everyone uh, move on. Thank you, Shankar, very much. Uh, we had a lot of questions, even a few that, that I couldn't get to. So a very engaged crowd uh, that very much appreciated your time. Uh, tomorrow, I remind you, we have another round. It's one hour offset, but back to back again. So uh, we look for you to show up tomorrow. And thank everyone for their time. And Shankar, thank you very much for uh, three years of uh, helping us with XTC. It's, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Great to meet you all and good luck on your journeys. Thank you, Shankar. Immensely valuable. As thank well. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.